Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Minister, for, for coming along this morning and giving us your time. We have with us here representatives from uh, all the organisations that you grant fund uh, through your department, through the Rural Transport Fund, and then through the Disability Action Transport as well. We also have some of our other members uh, who would be secondary purpose community transport providers, and uh, we're very grateful that they're with us this morning as well. And we also have some CTA staff lurking in the background so as well. Um, I think probably just to say, as we kick off, I know everybody's probably going to want to uh, you know, talk about lockdowns and what all of those sorts of things mean, but I know it's probably a very fluid situation at the moment and, you know, uh, details are probably emerging over the next couple of days and I know that officials from your department will probably be uh, given very specific details and communications to uh, community transport providers across yeah. Northern Ireland over the next couple of days of what can and can't be done and where we can and, and can't go. Um, so I appreciate you. You probably don't have any answers for us this morning, but we know that I've been in contact with, with some of your, um, your officials today, and I know that, that information is coming um, over the next few days uh, on that. So um, we thank you for, for all your support over the lockdown period. We in the Community Transport uh, Association are preparing a document which should be with you in the next few days, um, which outlines everything that community transport providers have done over lockdown and how we serve the community. And I know you took a very active interest. We're very grateful to see your tweets and your, your messages of support that we got through lockdown. It was very much appreciated uh, to get that level of support uh, from you, Nicola, as well. So we appreciate Welcome. that. And, and thanks very much for that. But thank you for your time. And we've got I've got a lot of questions in front of me, but it'd be really great to hear from you uh, and just uh, what what you'd have to say to 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 our members here today and, and the community transport providers who are here. So thank you very much, um, Nicola, and I'll let you um, uh, address the address our, our members. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Look. Um, I, I think this is a very important opportunity for me to be very much listening to you guys to understand what you see as challenges and opportunities. So what I just really want to say is to put on record my appreciation for all that you do, um, particularly the way that you have responded in COVID. I've been hugely impressed by your agility, um, just the speed with which you adapted, and the fact that you were there for some of the most vulnerable members um, of our community, so providing physical service, whether that was the delivery of groceries or so forth, but also just providing that connection to people. And it demonstrated to me the importance of having community transport uh, in terms of knowing who its community is, having those relationships. Um, and I think that sometimes we, we can be a bit clunky and we do things because that's the way we have always done them. Um, but it really reinforced to me the speed with which you were able to adapt your services and that it was, you were so proactive in doing it. It wasn't a matter of the department having to chase. You know, you very much led the way and were proactive in that. So I do want to put on record my appreciation for that. I mean, I understand, you know, you're hearing reports today. Um, a lot of the detail has to be worked up in regulations. But, you know, you'll have seen that it, there's... Um, uh, one of the guidance is around, you know, avoiding unnecessary travel. My officials are meeting with TO this morning because I'm clear that we need to have definitions around that. And we need to be very clear in terms of what we're explaining to people in terms of the interventions, how long they're going to last, but also giving people very clear guidance. So I've said to my officials to be getting as much clarity as they can and for us to be very much in the front foot and communicating that to people, because I think it's critical for compliance, but also for enabling all of us to try and get through this. So if you have specific questions, I may not be able to answer them. Um, I see First Dep first Minister's making a statement now, I think on the floor of the assembly or she, which will have just started, and then the regulations will be made and that will provide the specific detail of what businesses are being affected and, and the ramifications of that. But I'll try and answer any questions that you do have on that as well. Well, thank you very much uh, for that, Minister. Um, I, I'm just going to just going to ask a couple of questions just on behalf of uh, of the folk that the people that submitted questions to me. So, um, uh, and I'd be grateful to get um, get your thoughts on, on some of the issues that are affecting um, community transport. Um, I think 
the one thing it's always a big bugbear for community transport and this isn't just a, an issue here this is an issue really is across the UK and it's one that comes up time and time again at all of these events that we put on on behalf of our members in the Community Transport Association and it's really in relation to grant funding it's very difficult to plan and it's very difficult to look forward into the future if you're getting a year-to-year -year grant it's, it's very difficult to do anything but live hand to mouth yeah. and I suppose uh, People, people would like the security of being able to plan for the future, of being able to see, particularly in these times where we're coming out of a pandemic and where the future does seem uncertain. So really, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts uh, in and around the department's view on moving from a year-to-year -year grant to maybe multi-year grants, maybe three to five-year grants um, over the next couple of years. Is that a possibility? Is that something the department are considering? Is that something that we could see? Just to give that comfort that organisations will be able to, to plan for the future. Yeah, look, uh, I think that it's 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 not the right position to be in where you you correctly described it as living hand to mouth. So one year budgets, uh, you can't plan, you can't properly invest, and you can't be strategic. We need to be honest about that. Um, I'm a big advocate of um, us as an executive moving to a multi-year budget. It is a commitment within a new decade, new approach. I think it's essential if we are to properly plan. Uh, spend money properly as well. Um, we submitted as a department um, initial returns there for the comprehensive spending review. So essentially that was UK Treasury asking us to identify um, pressures for the next three years on our resource budget and the next four years for our capital budget. We submitted those returns now. We're waiting to see what will happen. I think it's going to be impacted on by COVID. But from my departmental perspective, it's impossible for me to give grants for three or five years when I'm essentially living hand to mouth as well in terms of only knowing what I get on an annual basis. You know, I'm not able to financially plan for years ahead. So I share your frustrations and I hope that that, given it's a commitment and new decade, new approach that we move as an executive to multi-year budget. So that would enable me to give greater certainty to community transport and to others that I support through my department. Yeah, well, I think for community transport, um, there's a, a particular issue in and around uh, vehicles. And I think community transport, we don't like to be seen as, as people who are, uh, are, are whinging. It's, we want to get the best um, transport solutions for the people who use the service. And I know that that's your heart as well, Minister, but I think that the difficulty comes in terms of capital funding for vehicles. The last time there was capital funding was, was five years ago with when DERA brought forward a capital fund as, and it's very hard to plan for uh, old, fleets becoming older and as buses get that sort of seven year, eight year, nine year um, uh, age span then it becomes almost impossible to run the service and it becomes something less than a gold star service for for the users. Is there any, any talk within the executive between yourselves and DERA um, about capital funding or, I mean, I know you've, my, my goodness, you know, you, capital funding in your department is a, is a huge issue. So, uh, you know, the sewers, you know, the, uh, the roads, everything, you know, you've got, you've got a big portfolio there. Is there any thought or, or any hope that we might see some capital funding or is it something that we could put on your radar? Is there something that we could do to help you to maybe bid in the Department of Finance for, for extra capital funding? Yeah, I mean, the, the difficulty here, and I hate yeah, having discussions around finance because they're always negative, because I have to be honest. Um, I do get a big capital budget. Half of it is instantaneously gone on executive flagships. I have no say in that. Um, uh, so that's a big challenge for me in terms of to try and money to find, to prioritise in other areas, because then you've got programme for government commitments. Then you've got NDNA, new decade, new approach that I have to factor in as well. Before COVID really hit hard, um, I had met with the dear minister to see, you know, were there areas that we could collaborate on, particularly in the area of kind of cleaner, cleaner greener environments. So maybe it's worth, you know, if you guys are touching base with him to see, is there something that we could do that's also, yes, about um, fleet improvement, but actually has that environmental benefit to it? So you're moving, you know, can we work on something that would be around lower emissions? Uh, and so we're coming at it from a transport, but also importantly from the environmental angle as well. So it's maybe something that I can raise with Edwin. Um, and if you guys are able to raise it with them as well to see, do you see, believe that there's merit in us both working on that together? Yeah, and I think that that's really, it's something that's really important for, for us as a sector is um, we, we feel a great sympathy for you and your position because 
the, the real users and beneficiaries of uh, of the capital of the grant funding that you give is the Department of Health. It's the Department for Communities. It's the you know the, the DERA. All of those departments are benefiting, and yet the financial burden falls on you. I wonder is there anything that we can do to help you to have better conversations with health, to have better conversations with communities, have better conversations with DERA? Because you know I, it, it is probably frustrating for your department that everybody said, well, well, Department for Infrastructure is going to pay for that, but yet Department for Health are quite happy to take the benefit as our communities and DERA. So how, how can we help you to, to feed into that conversation? I think it's by saying just that and being honest about it. I mean, when I took up this job, um, I had always been our party spokesperson on social justice and infrastructure for me was something that was quite alien. And I came to you thinking, you know, this is about roads and, you know, hard infrastructure, concrete. And day two, when I was getting my ministerial first day briefings, I actually realised that infrastructure is the fundamental block to everything. Um, and it impacts on a person's daily life. And when you get up in the morning, you know how the house has been built. When you put the tap on to get a shower, a glass of water, how you get to and from work, you know, the physical place shape and all of that. And so I've been very focused since I took up the job in trying to place infrastructure as something that's about people's lives. Now, I submitted a... Uh, infrastructure recovery paper to executive colleagues a good few weeks ago around our response to COVID and how infrastructure is key to the response from COVID in the challenges of Brexit um, but also in the climate emergency so it's very clear that it's infrastructure connects people it connects them to opportunities and to each other so it's tackling the social um, isolation as well as enabling them to get to education uh, and to employment and um, that it's also key in terms of driving investment. So if you look at the Northern Ireland water situation, we have around 100 locations now in Northern Ireland that are either at or beyond development capacity. So, you know, I feel that I'm making some progress there, but as you say, particularly with COVID, ministers have gone into their trenches mm. and we're in a battle for money. So a number of us were in a battle for money long before COVID hit. As a result of COVID and the impact of that financially, we're in greater dire straits. And so we've all, gone back into I'm battling for without actually looking to say well actually if if we stop and I know this is a bit naive but we stop seeing this as money going to an SDLP minister but seeing it as actually if you give it to infrastructure for this agreed purpose then we will have multiple benefits and perhaps we should be pulling our money to get um, investment in things that are multipliers so in terms of trying to address that frustration you'll have seen I think that I set up a an independent panel to advise me on an independent infrastructure commission and I think that's an important part of this discussion too because this will be saying if you invest in these key infrastructure projects or you take this strategic approach then you will have multiple benefits that the executive owns and so that's the, the, the conversation I'm trying to have and that's the argument that I'm trying to win and I always encourage people if they believe that, that if you invest in infrastructure and everybody has the different aspects of infrastructure, but if you invest in that, these are the multiple public health benefits, the educational benefits, the economic, the social, the environmental, like please be saying it. Mm. Yeah. You know, that, and if we don't have money, if we're not going to pull our resources here and we're not serious about our programme for government, which means that, you know, if, if Carl wants to build more houses, which I 100% support her in doing, you need to invest in water and wastewater. If you want to like grow the economy, then you have to tackle regional imbalance. Yeah. yeah. You know, so sorry for the rant, but no, okay. and it, 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 I just think if, if we could have that narrative and I always say to executive colleagues, believe me, I would be making this case even if I wasn't the infrastructure minister, because it's so clear that you need to be investing in infrastructure. You know, you need to be investing in your transport network. You need to be greening it. Um, mm -hmm. So any help you can bring and help me make that case would be good. Well, absolutely. I mean, I think that the key fundamental question and probably to be a bit more abstract for a second is like, how do we break down that silo mentality within government in Northern Ireland? Because it's been there right from 1998. And, and even through St Andrews, through, you know, new decade, right through the new decade, new deal, I don't think we've ever been able to break it. So, um, and I don't know if community transport is going to break it, but I mean, it's, it's how, how do we how do we break that, that silo mentality? I don't know. It's a huge challenge. Um, and I don't think, you know, that it is necessarily going to be broken at the party political ministerial level. I think it's going to be broken when people actually are speaking up and voting. Yeah. in ways 
Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, but I suppose when we when we have that sort of division, sort of entrenched within the electoral system insofar as designations and the assembly, I suppose that's uh, that, that's going to be difficult. Anyway, we're getting right off the topic of, of community transport. We're almost we're almost going into talk back here. <laughs> so I don't want to be I don't want to be William Crawley. So um, you're but, never off talk back. Ugh, well, you know somebody has to be on it. But but m m maybe 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 what we need to talk about is is the bridge to Scotland, Nicola, because you you were only at a pre-recording that. Where did you go? So, yeah, I had meetings. Oh, look, and, uh, listen, we're talking about community transport. <laughs> Imagine what we could do with twenty billion pounds, <laughs> and we could you know, be running. We could be running community transport to Scotland. My goodness! Yeah, on the <laughs> on the bridge and in clink, clink, clinky buses. And, you know. <laughs> well, just one last one last question on funding, and I know there's a huge irony in me asking this question, given that I was part of the the uh, part of the the. Uh, part of the, the SPAD team that caused the difficulties for, for Danny Kennedy when he was uh, one of your predecessors. But look, CT services, CT funding has been cut by 40% over six years. And I know that that's uh, as a result of the sort of the budget in around 2013, 2014, uh, when DRD was massively cut and we've never really recovered from that. And CT has been a victim of that. We know that community transport is a priority within the department and we know, you know, how much, you know, you've been very supportive of community transport and, and how central you see community transport within Northern Ireland. But without an increase in the funding budget, I mean, we've stood still now for the last three years. We've had, you know, before that, uh, a 40 percent cut in, in total funding, which which in real terms means that the budget is down probably in real terms by approaching 50 percent since uh, 2014. Is there any way that as we come into a new funding commitment and we know the pressures for coronavirus and coronavirus recovery, but um, is, is there discussions happening internally that would put CT you know, central to those discussions that we can start to see the budget increasing again so we can continue to deliver the service that we've been deliver, delivering in the past? Yeah, look, I recognise this. I think the difficulty is, um, as you say, the department was in its former life completely decimated um, back then and it hasn't fully recovered. And so I, my department is never given an allocation on the resource side that meets what it wants to do or, you know, it's, it's more a case of what have I to stop doing or what, what can I barely maintain upon like previous levels. So being completely honest and straight up at this moment in time, I'm not in a position to be able to increase budgets and there's no point me sitting here telling you something that I think you want to hear. I think you should just be honest. And that situation has been compounded by COVID now. I mean, I have an allocation in, in the October monitoring round on the resource side. Um, I don't know if that'll be successful. And again, that's kind of trying to plug gaps even with TransLink alone in Northern Ireland water because of the dramatic reduction in passenger numbers and income there. So in, in all honesty, at this moment in time, given the impact of COVID on the resource side and the budget as it was even before COVID, I wouldn't be in a position to be able to do it. Now, I wait to see what allocation I'm given next year and if I have more flexibility to move. And I do hope that you did, you have noticed it on the floor of the assembly and it's all recorded. I've been clear in comments around community transport, you know, I've been saying so that I'm on the record, that I value it, I see the importance of it and I want to be able to support it. But I have to be honest and operate within the financial constraints that I have. Yeah, well, um, we, we really appreciate the support, uh, uh, Minister, and, and what we've heard in the Assembly and, and even in your answers to, to written questions as well, you know, um, and, and what you've tweeted and all of that. You know, we've really appreciated that support. So thank you. But um, moving on to another topic, get off finance uh, for now and move to um, thinking about transport in, in its wider sense. Because we're moving out of this pandemic, it's pretty clear that the way um, we operate transport in Northern Ireland is not going to be uh, fit for purpose going forward. If you look at TransLink, I mean, we don't have a bottomless pit of cash to, to continue to pay TransLink to, to run all the services that we'd really like them to run. So I guess the question is, how, how can uh, we work with you to better facilitate a relationship between community transport and TransLink? to improve rural transport across Northern Ireland? Yeah, look, I, I've recognised that this is an issue. The way I kind of see it in my mind is in the area of transport, it feels to me as if no one has really gone up in the helicopter and taken a wider kind of holistic view of transport and how it can complement. 
So, for example, when I'm meeting with the um, private operators, for example, this would be an issue that they have. And it's about, I think, trying to look to see how we can have the public transport network complemented by community transport, complemented by the private operators to an extent. And then obviously there's a the taxi industry as well there. At the minute, everything seems to be very fragmented. And what I've asked my officials to do um, is, and I'd be keen to hear your views on it um, and your members' views, is to look at options for a review mm. of community transport services to see about trying to put it into that wider picture. I think if I had more time, again, being very honest, as a minister, more into a pandemic, I would have been keen to do a, a much wider review of our transport system, like a detailed piece to see how we can actually get a more holistic complementary but comprehensive approach to transport making sure that it's about servicing communities and needs and I'm very mindful like I'm from Belfast and I think people assume when you're from Belfast that you think the world begins and ends in Belfast I'm not I'm very conscious of rural areas and I'm very conscious of the need for connections I'm not I'm being straight up I'm not going to with the time left I'm with everything else going to be able to commission and get that piece of work done but I am keen to look at the role of community transport and I'd be keen I've just said to officials to bring me a sub on some of the options in terms of a review but I would be keen to hear your ideas and what you think a review should focus on you know the scope of it you know what objectives so I'd be keen to hear any thinking that you guys have done around that. Um, If, the, if you don't mind if I open it up the floor just on that and yeah. maybe get some people's views with um, if there's anybody who would like to, you know, g give some of their thoughts on um, what a, a review might look like or how the future might might look, does anybody want to address that? Just put your hand up and then we can... I'm conscious of putting you on the spot. So even if you want to follow up, you know, if you have some thoughts and you want to follow up, uh, my private office afterwards. As soon as you say open up the floor to this lot, my goodness, it's it's duck for cover, but uh, I can't. I've never seen them this quiet. So, has anybody um, anything they want? To? Jason? Yeah, uh, thanks, Tim. Minister, um, again, thank you for everything that you've said so far. And again, as Tim has said, we understand the pressures. I guess in looking forward, what we're very mindful of is in, in the experience that we have, we very much want to work with TransLink. You know, TransLink does the main routes very, very well and very, very effectively. But it's those localised routes where it's not working effectively and given the budgetary pressure and the constraints that you, you inevitably find yourself under and will increasingly find yourself under I suppose we believe that we can bring a real asset to that particular ecosystem that transport ecosystem in terms of being much more agile and able to deliver on those rural routes and I suppose part of that scope would be how can we how can we work more, more, more collaboratively? And I know with Orla and that we've talked about this as well and, and various other things that previously. But it certainly isn't an us versus them. It really is how can we develop the best system uh, that is demand responsive, that meets the needs, and particularly of those in rural areas. You know, for instance, in Fermanagh, we have 50, 60 seater buses going down the road to lift one person. That's a very expensive journey. Whereas we in community transport can deliver that much, much more efficiently and much, much more effectively and in relation to the needs of those individuals. And it's just, I suppose the question is, how long can we continue to go down that road facing the financial uh, scenario that we are? And how can we, through a review, maybe look at how we recalibrate that and, and support one another? Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any, any comments? I think, I think, you know, it, it's about there's a there's a small a small pot of money that we've got. So we've got we've got these this finite rate resource, and I think it's about how do we spend that better, and how, how do we how do we spend that money in a way? And this not, this isn't just for community transport. I mean, this is obviously for roads, for for big infrastructure projects. I mean, we, we have this finite resource, and it's it's how can we spend that better to maximize um, the impact that we have? And I mean, obviously that's. That's that's what we all strive to do within within public funding. But it, I think for community transport, we haven't reviewed service in in over ten years and and how it's operating. And I think there's a lot of innovation that's out there that we can see in other parts uh, of the UK that we can see uh, in the Republic of Ireland. Their local link 
um, is certainly an innovative way of providing community transport. And, and I think we can see things in, in um, the Netherlands and in Germany uh, that are innovative ways of providing demand responsive transport. And I suppose, how can we utilize that, that, um, th those innovations that we see uh, across the islands and across Europe and how can we bring that best practice here because the dial -a lift service and the disability action service was probably cutting edge when we brought when we yeah. brought it in as an executive but it's maybe not cutting edge anymore as we look at some of the work that's happening um, across across the UK um, I mean something that um, we've been calling on uh, for the department to look at for some time now is bringing in section 22 permits to Northern Ireland, that, that allows a community to run their own bus service if the public bus companies don't want to do that. So the public bus company has a chance to run the service, but they say it's uneconomic for us to run the service. So community transport or communities are allowed to then put that transport in place uh, for, for their communities where the public bus company isn't able to or doesn't want to, or it's become uneconomic to do that. And we, we haven't had that here in Northern Ireland. And I think probably with TransLink being in a position of retreat and understandably so because of funding, you know, it might be something that might be a tool that we could utilize as community transport, um, as, as district councils put in their um, community plans. I think it's something that could be part of that. Um, I don't know if there's any conversation going on within the department and in around those sort of community bus permits or, or any other innovations across uh, Europe and, and the UK. Yeah, we had started to discuss this actually um, just before COVID hit. It could maybe bring Orla in on that. And the also thing I noticed, I think Diane, did you want to come in as well? Did you raise your hand? No? Prior? No? Okay, sorry. I thought, I thought you had and I didn't want to be rude in case I was just speaking to Rhea. But maybe Orla, if you'd come in and you can just give an update on where we are, where, where we yeah. were before COVID really. Yeah. Um, Philip, are, you're there as well. You're on mute, Philip. Yep. Okay. There you go. Uh, I know you'd been engaging with Stuart more recently on the Section 22. Is that right? Yeah. Um. I. I. I Stuart would be on on his side of things. Um. Orla. So I'm not aware of um any particular detail on this, but I'm aware that Stuart, it was something that um Stuart had been been asked about. Um. Yeah. Uh, but uh, in terms of any detail at this stage, no. I'm I'm not aware of. of yeah. Okay. okay. Um. Well, I I suppose that. That is the position at the moment that Stuart on the, the licensing side that is is looking after um, the query about Section 22 at the moment. But certainly it is an active issue. Uh, that maybe, is, that is yeah, maybe we, have, we could have a look at just in terms of when we are doing our thinking around the review. Absolutely. Yeah, and to be honest, I think that would always be an element of the review because certainly from, from what I know about CT operators in, in England. It is their delivery mechanism and it also allows people to, to tender for, for additional work, um, which I think given the position you guys are, are now in, having lost a lot of your group hire, um, is maybe something that, that would be beneficial in terms of longevity for you. Yeah. Um, Pat, Patty there, do you want to come in? Paddy, Paddy's going to thank you, uh, Nicola, because he's he's a, he's going to thank you for Kissman Park. So, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah he, he cannot wait to get down there with uh, with Derry hurlers and uh, being the Ulster final. Play, played there for ten years, best playing surface in Ireland. Delighted to hear it's coming back. Uh, badly must, but anyway, uh, <laughs> on the. Um, and that's way back in the nineties, just in case you can't see old Ram. Uh, <laughs> oh, don't worry, Paddy. I can say. Paddy played in the last match at Kissman Park. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think for me, the the, the the important point to mention when we're when we're looking at um, looking at you know new ways and, and working better together, the, the 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 big integrated transport project that ran two for two or three years back, four or five years ago. I, I think we need to learn from that because I think it tried to do things at a very high level, ministerial sort of departmental level. And I think our solutions are really have to be really, really localized. And I mean, Jason has touched on it there earlier, and we're, we're doing a wee bit of work in Fermanagh and Oma, just the council uh, through community planning, where they're trying to look at small local pilots where either TransLink coverage is, is very poor. The, the problem as well with TransLink coverage, if you say, show us a map of the TransLink routes in Fermanagh and Oma, there's a lot of roads on the map 
are blue or whatever to say this is a route. But I mean, that could be two days a week, a, a bus right. at half nine in the morning, a bus at five o'clock in the evening. Or if you took the school translink route out of it, there's nothing. So, so it's nearly hiding the fact that there isn't really a, 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 any level of public transport that's suitable for any type of attending appointments or getting to something with, which is time specific. So I, I think there's, a, there's an issue there where, where we're, we're not really seeing how bad it actually is when, when, when you look at TransLink routes uh, sort of just on a blank page, it doesn't tell the full picture. So we're, we're looking at pilots in very localized areas where, for example, in Fermanagh, there was, a, there was a GP surgery closed in one village and they've been asked to move to another village and there's not a TransLink route. Um, we're, we're looking at where there's no TransLink routes between two localized villages. So I, I think the solutions and what we're best at is that very localized, very specific wee piece of work that needs done. And, and, and that's, that's our area of expertise. That's where we talked about earlier about the, our flexibility during COVID, how quickly we can respond to local need. That's what we're best at. We, we do not want to be running buses between from Enniskill and Roma. That's not our job. TransLink, are to, that's, their, that's their bread and butter. They're best at that. But, but there must be some way where we can look at TransLink spend a lot of money on very localized rural routes so infrequently that there's no point even running the bus. And, and we, we can do that on a demand responsive uh, basis, even with a volunteer car scheme. You know, we don't even need to put a bus on. So uh, it's just that notion of being able to work with TransLink very locally rather than yeah. Mr. Conway yeah. talking to the, the, the health or talking to council. It, it's, it's a localized solution and that's what we're best at, but it's, that's hard to do. That's very that part, a wee bit here, a wee bit there. But... For me, that's that's the direction we need to go. Very, very localized solutions, uh, and, and just do it a wee bit at a time. We we tried the big picture one, and TransLink mm -hmm. and education and health, they went round and round in circles for three years, and nothing came out of it. Mm -hmm. So, can I ask a couple of questions, Patty? To see the pilots that you're looking at, who is there funding for that? Like, where's the funding from that coming? And is that part of the LDP, the local development plan process? And no, do we know if that's an approach that's being worked across us other council areas? It's hit and miss. There was a wee piece of work done, I think, in Bullies area and North Coast, and that sort of there wasn't much to that. But this came out of really, I think, it, it came out of our involvement with the council, with the BFC food parcel deliveries, and we it really raised our profile, and we got huge credit yeah. and, and a lot of very good PR out of it. And people within council started to realise these guys know what they're at. They, they know how to get things done. They know the local areas. They know the rural communities. They're, they're well connected. So from mm -hmm. Ananoma um, did a review of their community plan and they had something like 48 priorities a year ago. And they decided with, from a point of view of a sort of COVID recovery, they, 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 they reviewed their community plan and chopped that to 18 priorities. And within that, they included a new priority, which wasn't there before on looking at um, better rural connections, particularly with community transport. And they've asked myself and Jason to lead on it, which again, that's very significant. It's not like a council to ask two local charities to lead in that, uh, but all is involved and, and we're just trying to pull the group together. But we're very much at the starting point being council need to contribute, PHA or trust need to contribute, the DFA maybe tip on a bit, but we're, we're trying to show on a very localized small scale that if everybody threw in five or 10 grand, we can do, great work and, and we're trying I, I think well I'm not well speaking Orla can come in and correct me if not but I think Orla is, is excited about it because it might show that you know this is the solution it has to be Absolutely. three to four different departments putting in a few pounds if we can show that working in Fermanagh and Oma then that really strengthens the case for maybe you approaching health minister yeah. or, yeah. minister, or dear minister to say look it's working we, you have to contribute it makes this it, it makes the difference so now we've only started, we were literally just pulling together the stakeholders. Uh, this was, the council asked us to lead in this about three weeks ago, so it, it's new. But That's good. So, but I, I, again, the point being, it's all about local, it's all about the, the wee rural village, the two or three mile trips into the local GP surgery or to the local shop. We do not do main routes in and out of the big towns. That, that's not our job, you know, we don't want to do it. Um, no. But it's about the TransLink struggle was. So we, we think it's a, it's a perfect solution, you know, but whether TransLink can sort of move out of some of those routes and, and we can move in to cover it, um, it's, sometimes it's not that simple, you know. And could I ask, like, um, just for a straight bad answer, is, were the obstacles to this happening? And I like that local scenario. 
yeah, like, so what I'm trying to understand is, you say, like, you have Swedes, well, you have a lot of rural communities where it's clear they're not being properly connected by the public transport network. I dare say it's not vi- economically viable for mm-hmm. the public transport provider to be doing it. So, you know, that's a bit of a, you know, not a nonsense, but you know what I mean? There's questions there. Then you have locally people who are saying, right, well, there's a local service here who could step in there to provide that at much cost effective yeah. um, way, but actually in a way that services the community better. So what is stopping that from nearly naturally becoming a partnership? Where are the obstacles? One of, one of the things that stops it is if Transing talk about pulling a rural route, the, all the local councils are not. Mad. Uh, and, and, and then somebody will ask the question, well, how many is using that route? Oh, well, there's there's two people from Garson. Yeah. Possibly they, you know, but 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 the councillors in that area will fight to the death. We're, and we're saying, look, we we can serve, we can give them a better service, we can take them into the town three or four times a week, whereas that bus is only going two days. So it's 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 how you. There is a bit of politics in it, but about about it's very it's a big thing to suggest you pull a rural route. The local councillors and MLAs go nuts when in fact we'd be making the case that we we probably provide a better service. You know, a more demand responsive times that suit the client direct door to door, lift you at your house and take you to the to the GP surgery rather than walk to the main road, mm. get on a bus into the middle of town and have to walk or taxi to the to the hospital no more or something, you know? Yeah, but I, I sorry. Sorry, Rilla. So the conversation I, then needs to be presented as you're not losing something. No. You're actually gaining. Mm. So the way it's being it, it needs to be presented as a package. You know, rather than just right transit are going to pull this route. So okay. Yeah, okay. I think Sorry, one of the big I think one of the, the big opportunities for us to to explore and maybe even pilot that that type of localized service would be through the the PSA work that minister is currently going on at the moment. So the, the review of the the contract with Translink. Um, and you know, I think that is a big opportunity for us to look at you know, Translink perhaps not delivering those on profitable rural routes and the likes of yourselves being able to step in. Now, clearly that will have implications for for your licensing. Um, And, you know, if that is something that the minister is, is going to look at and potentially bring forward, then we will need to really communicate clearly with yourselves from the off because you'll need to be able to get yourselves into a position to make sure that you can have the appropriate license to deliver that service, whereas at the moment you clearly couldn't. Mm. Obviously, a Section 22 permit would alleviate that um, yeah. that issue. Um, because obviously with a, a Section 22 permit, um, if a route is abandoned by the public bus company, then a community transport organisation can be brought in by a district council or by the department, or even very often, um, in England, Scotland and Wales, the the bus company will abandon the route but enable the community transport provider to, to bring that in. But also the, the thing that's the beauty of a Section 22 permit is the community can act themselves, so it can be bottom up. So there may never have been a route there uh, at all, but the community actually then say, well, we want that route. I mean, I, I give an example. I was at a meeting last year uh, with a little village just outside Oxford and they're, they're about three miles from a pretty good bus hub. And the community themselves decided to buy a bus and to run a route from the center of the village to the to the bus hub. And that's tran- that's transformed that village. They're now on the main bus network. They can get to London, they can get to Oxford, they can go wherever they want because they're now on, on a main bus route. And they're only three miles from the route, this village, and it had no public transport. But the community themselves came together and said, we want to do this. And then the local authority in Oxfordshire then enables them to do that. But we don't we don't have that power here uh, to be able to do that. And I think that 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 stymies uh, that kind of community action to be able to do that. So, okay. Uh, and I think one of the big things actually for, for Patty and myself and the council and the other folks is that it's really been very, very transparent in the information and around the availability of services and how they do fit with going to work and doing the other things. Because that, that information is not clear. Someone says you need a degree to read a timetable from TransLink in a rural area. And, and, and that, that is the big issue that comes back. So what we're trying to do is to do some really detailed mapping that really speaks and, and, and really communicates that case. Uh, and I think that seems to be a consistent issue across the board, as well as people just thinking, well, we're, we're exclusively about transport. They don't see it's about keeping people out of hospital. 
uh, living independently and all of that as well, which is most you know we do. But yeah, yeah, and I think just a lot of functional fixedness. Again, we recognise that silos have existed. It takes time to break silos down, so you know, hopefully we'll get there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and Jason, I suppose what I would say about the the pilot that uh, Jason and, and Paddy are are involved with is I think that could be a great opportunity for us to produce yet more evidence about, at the moment, the funding you provide, Minister, is Dial-A-Lift and, and DATS in the urban areas. Uh, but we have all the stats that show us that the users of those services are largely going to day opportunities, uh, health appointments, and yet health are not engaged with us at all. Um, so I think that pilot could be really really useful evidence for us to try and get more engagement from from health as well as communities okay yeah we've, we've got lots of ideas there's lots of things we can do so mm -hmm. we can and a lot of this a lot of this is no cost it just requires a little bit of regulatory thinking a little bit of working together so a lot of it's low cost or no cost because even the, the dial lift service you could easily morph into a semi-scheduled um uh, bus route um, and that, that could be easily done but that would require a little bit of legisl legislative change to make that happen and actually so for for ver for almost no cost um, some of these things could be put in place so um, there's plenty that can be done that, that, just, that just isn't going to be a drain on finances. And I also think you know the reality of COVID is that we are going to have to do things differently if we think that we can just go back to doing exactly what we were doing before then we're deluding ourselves so, you know, there's always change comes about because people actively seek it or change comes about because it's imposed on you. This is pandemic is a huge disruptor. So we are going to have to think differently and we're going to have to be much more collaborative. And we're going to have to recognise the fact that people are not going to be travelling in the same ways that they were before. More people will be working from home. Um, you know, we, we've, for me, I think the pandemic has brought home the most important thing is people. <laughs> You know, what we find most difficult is being separated from each other, right? So, you know, that needs to be front and centre of government policy and its investment. So I just think now is a good time and an opportune time to be looking at doing things in a better way and in a new way. And so I think, you know, th there's an opportunity. I think this pilot, from what I'm hearing, will be exciting in terms of trying to map a way forward. And I think it's doing multiple things. One of the most important things is demonstrating to the local council and the local reps the importance of the community transport sector. And that will help when we start to bring about change and the, and the fear that people have when, you know, if there's alterations to the public transport route and that you're presenting this thing as a package. So, you know, it is a difficult time, but I genuinely believe this is a chance to try and do things better. Absolutely. And we, we really want to work with you to do that and to see better regulation and to see, you know, services being delivered in a way that, that meets the needs of the passenger and the, and the user. So. Definitely. I know our time is almost up, so I, but I've got one final question, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Around the thorny issue that's been rolling on for a number of years now and around driver licensing. Now, obviously, yeah. the department brought out its guidance on driver licensing in 2018, and the uh, Department for Transport, they held off issuing driver licensing uh, guidance. So we've been in a situation where there's a there's stricter guidance here where somebody has to do the full PCV D1 CPC, whereas in England, Scotland and Wales, um, the, the guidance would still be that, that that's not required or the minimum parts two and four of CPC is all that's required, which would be a much easier standard to obtain uh, for drivers who are utilising permits. Um, now I get that there's there's legal advice in the department yeah. and, and all of that, but obviously there's different legal advice in England, Scotland, and Wales. I, I don't know what conversations are happening with DFT, if any, or, or is there any chance that the department may look at that again and put us on a level playing field with England, Scotland, and Wales, where um, we could do the, the the parts two and four of CPC rather than than the the, the full PCVD one. Yeah, and we're okay. getting very technical stuff here. I know, yes. I'm not an ac acronyms fan about their I, I, I don't know how to members. explain it a bit, a bit easier. Uh, no, I know, but, I know. Yeah. Look, I, you know, I, I understand the concerns around this, and the guidance was issued before I took up post, right? Mm -hmm. And the department has sought legal advice on it. And so, 
it is a legislative requirement. I think that's a difficulty. I think, you know, if I were just to change the guidance, that doesn't change the root of the problem, which is the legislative basis. So, I mean, I think there, I've said to my officials to be reviewing the guidance. I think we need to be looking at it and how things develop. Obviously we have, you know, Brexit. Um, and does that change things? I think it provides an opportunity to be looking at this issue in terms of the legislative basis to it. So it's something that I am very conscious of and I've asked officials to be looking at. And I'm also mindful that, you know, with EU exit, if it happens, Tim, hmm. um, and I keep... I voted for me, and people keep, but, on, people keep on respecting <laughs> me as a leave voter. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, because we're saying, or the, the legal advice that we're getting and the advice that I'm getting is that this is about, you know, uh, your European legislation and NI adhering and aligning with that with GB aren't and we have legal advice to say all of that so what I'm saying is in the situation there's an opportunity to look at things differently you know when we exit the, the EU as well so it is something that I've asked officials to have a look at for, for me so the concern I have and how it functions you know I've had a lot of teachers even come to me and say about it as well doing you know, runs to sporting events or whatever and, and different events and how it's curtailing them and the service that they're providing and the experience that they're giving to the kids at the school. So I am I am conscious of it. Yeah, and it's been a big issue in around shared education as well because that's relied on teachers with school minibus. And we have uh, with Pete Clugston here, who's the, you, you've fallen foul of this with, uh, uh, you've had to get your um, your youth workers trained. Um, okay. you, you maybe let us know what the cost of that or how that's been within your organization. Yeah, I, um, it's taken, we said at the start about how we're living, you know, hand to mouth with money and we're having to use money that we're getting in to train up people, to drive, to take 10 kids to bowling or to the cinema or whatever. And it's money that we could be best put into the community. And it's just costing a lot of money. And we only got the bus just before this change. And we were happy to go along. Unfortunately, I know Tim. And Tim happened to, to mention this. Because um, I know that a lot of people are are operating and they don't really understand. You know, the smaller groups, it's different, the bigger, the bigger charities. But the likes of churches and, and you know, small youth groups or whatever that have one, one minibus like we do. Yeah, uh, the amount of money that it costs to put people through the training, it's it's almost almost not worth it. Yeah, it's sad. It's, but it's, it's obviously, I mean, all we can ask is that it's, it's kept on the review, and we really appreciate that. You know, uh, Nicola, that's that that's really good for us. Uh, William, do you want to make? William, William, William and Pete are, are our only two secondary purpose organisations here, so this is this is a big issue for them. So yeah, uh, yes. Um, the problem is with us is that we are a small charity. We have about eighty members on our books. Uh, it's obviously people with mental health issues long term. Um, and for well, personally myself, for the last twenty years, I've been able to drive. I've even had a, a, a position as a driver in a different company and was able to, to, to collect these people from their home, take them to, to, to wherever we were going. But in reality, uh, the bus actually belongs to our members. Uh, we funded it ourselves. Um, we collect our members locally uh, from their house and bring them up to the club. It's a social setting for them. And our problem is, okay, we tried to get funding for it to get the drivers through it. Our drivers have been here that long. A couple of our drivers are well over their 50s. And we already had two guys go through it and fail. We have no more money to do that. Now, we did get, a, I think it was a Section 10B permit, mm -hmm. uh, which allowed us to bring volunteers in who didn't have the D1 NRFH, so we could use them. But it, it, they're undependable, and our members are really struggling with this. Um, again, I've been looking through other licenses. There's another one there, I think it might be a Section 19, where it, it's word for word the same as our as section 10b over here except for in the section 19 there's a small section just says charities will be exempt from this i mean we don't charge our members we, we charge nothing we're funded for the bus and it's really it's it's it's, it's having a, a big effect on, on our charity 
Okay, yeah. okay, William. Thank you. But it's yeah, it's a big issue, and it's it's one that we've we've brought up with the Department of Communities as well. It's one we can probably bring up with Carol. Um, because in Scotland, and we've got our CTA Scottish director here, she, we don't have time to hear her wax lyrical about her D1 training project. <laughs> she gets uh, people in the third sector, um, young people particularly, gets in their PCV D1, and it's, the, this, it's Transport Scotland who are funding that, uh, to about £2,500 per person. Um, okay. I think it's about 50 have gone through already, and we're look, hoping to maybe open it up again for another... 100, 150 over the next few years. And it's been really successful um, in getting people, uh, taking away the burden that William and, and, and Pete have been talking about from the third sector and, get, and getting people the, the qualification and getting people through and, and future proof in the sector. But I think that's something we've been talking uh, way back in the day of uh, Paul Given in, in communities was, was the day we started the conversation and then we had our three year shutdown and that kind of then slipped off the, the agenda to try and move towards that. But I think it's something maybe we can pick up between infrastructure and communities to, to, to look into that because it's, it's a real benefit to the third sector to have the qualified drivers and to have that comfort that, that people have the PCVD1 and CPC uh, and takes away the, the problems that Williams articulated and Pete's articulated around charity funds going to pay for for driving so it's something we can pick up with you and maybe we okay. can we'll have a chat with Carol as well about that. Yeah that'd be good. Would. Okay. But, our time has gone. Thank you. You've been really generous. We've gone over time. So we have. So thank you so much for, for coming. And hopefully we can, we can get you back to, to, to ask you a few questions in the future again. And we sure. look forward as well just to hearing in the next few days about how all of this is going to play out and yeah. uh, where we're going to go. My wife's furious because her 40th birthday is now falling in the middle of the uh, of it all. So all, all of our trips and plans are gone. Wow. So I told her we, we get a Chinese takeaway. That's about the height of it. I think that's big spender, Tim. Well, you know, generosity is, is one, of my, one of my one of my key key attributes, as you can see. Oh dear. <laughs> but uh, I also need some advice on what the buyer is a present, so I don't know, <laughs> but but we'll see. But listen, thank you so much for your time, and uh, what's a really bu been a really busy twenty four hours for you. No so. problem. No problem. And thank you, everybody, for your time as well. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. All thank right. You, Take Marissa. care, everyone. Well, bye thanks bye. very much. Thank bye. you. All the best. Bye-bye.